Hello and welcome, folks, to another edition of RSF Radio. I'm your host, Joe Monday, and I have a very special guest today. Uh, you have definitely seen some footage that he's taken, I guarantee it. At some point in your life, if you are listening to this podcast, you have seen something that this man has shot. Esteban Martinez, how you doing? Hey, what's up? <laughs> doing. You know what? For all that energy that I threw at the beginning of this, I'm, I'm like very sick. Oh, very, very sick. It seems, it seems to be going around too. I think you're like the third person today I've seen who says they're, they're sick. Uh, yeah, I'm just like I'm, I'm just ragged, man. I'm ragged, and it's Tuesday. The tournament tournaments on Monday, and then the next day is always like it's always rough, man. It's, that yeah, it's the grind; style. it never ends. You, you know, you think you get a day off, and then you got to do a podcast, you got to run a tournament, you got to go play in tournaments, you oh, see the kids, yeah. you know. Oh uh, yeah, like yeah, fitting real life stuff into that is like that's a fucking miracle. Yeah, um, I don't know how any of us do it. <laughs> yeah, honestly, when people are like, "Ah, I was like with my family," I'm like, "Oh, you had like time." To like live a real human life, a social <laughs> life. What is, what is that? Uh, but other than that, things are good. Uh, it was brick. Actually, you don't know this, but people who listen might know. Uh, it was my dog's birthday this weekend. Aww. And we have a habit of throwing him a very large party, which <laughs> to us is very silly because it's like it's just a, it's tiny dog. His birthday, Brick's his name. And the larger the party, the more extravagant the party is, the funnier the joke is to me. So it's like having all like little food stuffs that are dog themed. And it's really just a reason to drink with friends and have everyone over the place. But uh, other than <laughs> so that, happy birthday surprise. I just did this so I can have some tequila. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> tequila shots are like the go to. It's just sometimes you need that bite, a little bite of tequila. Anyway. We're not here to talk about dog birthday parties. We're here to talk about what we you've could. been doing. <laughs> well, I mean, we could. We could. Sure. Surely I could fill this hour I'm with... sure that'll be thrilling for your <laughs> listeners. I mean, one of these one of these days I'll... It'll Let be me a tell dog. you about the siesta I gave a Cocker Spaniel once. <laughs> it'll be a full-on dog cast over here. Uh, but no, but seriously, though, uh, you have done a... You've been doing work within the community for quite some time now, and people have definitely laid eyes on the material that you've shot. But right now, currently, you have something going on where you've kind of branched out into your own. You're doing a like a solo job. Is it a solo? I actually didn't ask this before we started talking, but is it all solo work? Yeah, it's all me, uh, which is <laughs> very fun and also a living nightmare of my own creation. Yeah, I imagine it's very scary. But of course, what we're talking about is that you've put together a it, it's kind of serial is it like serial mm, i don't know so, okay let me, let me explain it let me explain it um so i have a channel called hold back to block uh, it's right. a youtube channel where i used to just do like interviews similar to like born free or, or the like right we just go to events like starting around like 2012 um i would go to events and just interview people because at the time people weren't really doing that um, I did that for a couple of years, and then I put out a, a documentary called FGC Rise of the Fighting Community, and then uh, that did pretty well, and I started getting like client work, like con like like actual like real paying work, and for a couple of years I focused on that, um, and then recently, you know, as of a couple of months ago, I was like, hey, why don't I just you know the channel was just sitting there, so I was like, why don't I just go back to the channel and start doing some of the things I learned from outlets like No Clips and stuff like that, like that that I worked with, and you know, set up a Patreon and started to focus on kind of documentary or more like long form features on the fighting game community. So like once a month, I put something out like a, whether there's a doc in development of a fighting game, such as a doc we, I did recently on them's fighting herds, or, you know, a look at a local, like I did with health local tech and local in, in New York, uh, and kind of really start to build content that kind of dives deeper than, than most of the outlets that are, that I see out right now. So, and so yeah, hold back to block is what I've been working on right now. I'm, I'm very impressed by this because it is doing something. It is actively doing something something that I feel like the community has lacked for a long time and you're you're basically like taking and recording some history here like you're getting it on tape for people mm -hmm. to come to at a later date and say oh this is where we were and it, it's it's much harder to forget where we've come from as a community when we have something as solid as this to go back to and look and say here like this is 
these are the roots. It's like this right. is this is history here. He, there's here's who these people are, and here's why they're in the positions that they are today, and this is why decisions are being made. It's a it's whether you consider it a service or not. I think it's a it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, that's that's been the the thing that I've been interested in the most. Like outside of the games, like obviously I love fighting games. I play I play fighting games more than most games, mm-hmm. but. Um, I've always been interested in the people and the events that happen and the culture. Like, you know, we have our own language, we have our own like frame of reference right. for, for specific yeah. things. Uh, and it's universal amongst like these games, you know, we talk about neutral, like it changes depending on game to game, but everyone knows what we're talking about. And that translend that transcends like culture and, and, and language barriers and stuff like that. So like, you know, we've created our own weird network, our own civilization. So it was weird to me that people weren't, talking to people or 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 the people who make the games and stuff like that so i I just decided to do it myself because that's just fun for me yeah and there's a lot of hmm, what's the best way to put this uh i don't know if it's like intentional obfuscation but things there's i mean there's like a reason why we call it like the illuminati right it's like (laughs) this this hidden information that's that's somewhere out there that like someone like what is new who defined all of this right what is like i don't know it's really interesting to have that that someone is going after that history or that information just to get that recorded down uh but with that though uh well let me actually get this out here because it's this is the start of the show. I have to let people know where people can find you because if sure. we, we wait till the end of the show, people are going to turn it off and they they don't listen to the, the stuff at the end. So like where, where, where can people go to find the stuff that you're creating right now? So uh, the YouTube channel where everything lives is on youtube.com slash hold back to block. Everything is free. It's ad free. You don't need to be a patron to watch um, like 90% of the stuff I put out. Uh, however, if you do want to support me and what I'm doing, you can go to patreon.com slash hold back to block. And we've got various tiers in there that you can kind of, you know, uh, become a patron of and get like a behind the scenes stuff or, or extra. Like we have a big project with Killer Instinct coming up where I'm going to be putting a ton of like extended interviews and stuff like that that aren't going to make it to the channel immediately. Uh, in there so especially if you like killer instinct there's a lot of good stuff coming that way and mm-hmm. then if you uh don't get tired of me after this interview you can follow me at uh, twitter.com slash the best of all all right uh that is that piques my interest i feel like there's a lot of stories to tell with like the that chicago area did did you take a trip out to chicago are you talking to those <sighs> okay people? so I, I let me tell you about my last four weeks um, okay. <laughs> I took my first vacation in about three years, four years, Shit, and I uh, fucked off to two and a half weeks over in Asia. I went to like Tokyo. I played at Master Cup. Uh, I then went to see a friend in Korea. Uh, I came back, landed in, like landed back in Philly, uh, packed up my camera equipment, and went back out to Chicago <laughs> in 12 hours. Uh, I went down there and I inter- interviewed um, – I'm going to mess his tag up, but Isaac Torres, Del Rach, yeah, Del Rach out in Iron Galaxy. Then mm-hmm. from Chicago, I went to um, San Antonio and interviewed Quake Viking with Brandon Alexander, Alexander who did the whole uh, KI World Cup, the KI Tour. And then from there, I went to SoCal and interviewed members from you know John Batista and other members of uh, double helix and then from there I went to orlando to interview keats so i've been on the road for about two and a half weeks just shooting stuff for killer instinct uh hmm. I- i've been in four different time zones and i don't know what's up or down anymore <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah it, it, and but there's a lot of cool stories of that like that that that's uh it's not going to be out to december but that's a project that i think people should keep their eyes on yeah no you named a lot of names there that i would be thoroughly interested in hearing what they have to say about the community where like the origins of ki for them Mm -hmm. uh how they went about making that game and where they think fighting games are right now in terms Mm -hmm. of development i'm sure maybe that has been talked about i'm i don't know i'm only guessing here keith and Uh, i talked for an hour and 45 minutes i think an hour of that was on KI. Forty-five minutes was on like the state of <laughs> fighting games as a whole. Uh, so I'm really excited to put some of that stuff out. Yeah, that in particular, Keats man. I I would love to hear him rant. I'm sure that hmm, maybe let's put it this way: uh, people who are interested in Patreon, maybe there's an uncut for. <laughs> hour long conversation there will be at least a full hour at least if i don't just put the whole thing like, i could have made a doc out of just him right. uh but like a full hour of like uh, uh stuff from keats and, and i already told him i'm gonna cut we talked about netcode specifically because that's a hot topic right. right now um and we went into it like uh 
you know how exactly it works in like the five tell me like i'm a five-year-old kind of way mm -hmm. and and the different case studies of it so that's going to be a, a small video for itself that'll go up for for everybody and then the rest will be like extended stuff that's fucking rad that's yeah. actually awesome uh because from people who haven't been following uh ggpo was just released to the public for free yes, uh, yes. tom Cannon was just like hey uh here you go it's yeah. it's out there now and man that like I, hmm. it's one of those things where i'm not certain what that means for non english developers that is one of the things we talked about um because if you look at fighting games as a whole you know because i've been doing a lot of uh research into development side of things like a lot of american games like you know mortal Kombat, killer instinct a lot of fighting games like indie games like punch planet times fighting herds already use ggpo mm -hmm. uh it's the developers outside the country particularly in japan that do not um so it's not that it hasn't been used before or can't be used before but it might even be a cultural thing like maybe you know they don't want to use tech that doesn't originate from japan or maybe you know there's somebody who who just is too stubborn and believes it's like a, you know it's our way of doing things or not at all so it, it comes down to maybe it's like a cultural thing maybe it's a conversation that needs to be had between developers maybe more developers should talk more to each other like it's not a tech thing it's not just a tech thing because it's been proven even with games like mortal Kombat, like mkx like even post-release if you do the work you can add that stuff in there so the question is why aren't you and, right. and if it's not if it's not a skill set issue then is it a cultural one? And that's something we go into. Yeah. Or even like games that didn't even have rollback in mind. Uh, Nether realms in particular did that really good. Uh, gosh, what, where were they where they gave that talk on how Jeez. they, yes. And how they fixed injustice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like the amount of work that they did to make that work with a game that wasn't designed with, with rollback in mind was like, Oh shit. Like, it can still be done like yeah. you can still fix this stuff yeah. like it's not it, easy but you can still fix it right but if you start at the ground level with having that rollback net code in mind then it it can be a very easy just not a, a plot not like a it, it, this is also another like fallacy i don't want to throw out there into the mic it's not like you drag and drop that folder into the netcode folder right <laughs> right that's GGPO. something we talked about with, with the ks stuff it's like oh now that it's yeah. free do you do you think people think like oh now every internet you know online mode is gonna be fixed now and it's like yeah. of course not like you can't make it easier <laughs> but you, it, it's definitely you know planning at the the get-go of development stages is, is where you want to do it and so that's like another reason why i did this whole thing so mm -hmm. i used to work with a group called no clip who's who's it's daniel dwyer and jeremy yeah. jane daniel dwyer is a former uh game spot editorial um head i guess is what you would say and i worked on a couple of projects with them and they're doing really great work with mainstream games and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but i wanted to do something similar with fighting games because one you know there is an open dialogue between developer and fighting game player mostly because you know some fighting game players lose their mind if you take away like a, a plus two jab or some shit so people just you know everyone hides and like we don't want to deal with the the mm -hmm. fervor so i wanted to create a space where i can talk about the development of these fighting games and kind of like uh, uh expose a little bit of what it is to make them and what is the 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 discussions being had because you know like uh I love like people like like some of these people like Sage and stuff like they're, they're my friends and they're going like well, why can't you do this and why can't you do that and, blah, blah, blah. and these conversations have already been had yeah inside development <laughs> like these are not new conversations it's not like the guy who's dedicated their lives or, or the woman that's dedicated 20 years of their life to game development didn't think hey why don't we don't why don't we use ggpo no shit it works um <laughs> But, you know, there's other things. There are, like, the, you know, department heads or, you know, right. the fact that only 20% of the people or 30% of the people are ever going to see an online mode in a fighting game. Or, like, you know, you know, budget. Like, one line yeah, needs another, but it just doesn't yeah. work. Like, like, obviously, people have thought about these. Obviously, there have been discussions about this. So I wanted to make a place where we can talk about it and we can go into it. And then, you know, with that being exposed and with that being out there, then the conversation get a little more deeper throughout the community and there's a little more understanding. And then the bridge starts to form between a, a little bit better between developer and player and, and stuff like that. So that was like one of the, one of the end goals of holdback blog. Yeah. I actually think that that, that particular conversation when it was had in the, 
them fighting herds uh, documentary is I forget who it was or maybe they they all kind of touched on this of just making the thing and and letting people discover things as they yes. not really like forcing people to play a certain way just like yes. seeing what the community re, how it rea- like how people react to it how like people want to play is it different from how they were playing the game and that conversation I thought was really interesting yeah, Oreo talks about it when when testing was like he had his yeah. set way to play it, um, but then once it gets in the community hands, like they're gonna they're gonna take it and run with it, and you can either force them to play your way, which nobody likes, or take what they're doing. But like, okay, how can we how can we give them better tools or you know better balances so people aren't running away and like with ninety percent combos and stuff like that? But give them better tools to let them enjoy what they're doing and also make it matter and i think that's really important um you know similar with ki ki is balanced in a way like uh, you know i was just watching last night the the season three changes they previewed live at a uh, ki cup a couple years ago mm-hmm. and a lot of those changes were made to like okay we're gonna like you know bring a character in line a little bit so that they're not doing things that other people can do like unbreakable stuff uh, but also accelerate and enhance what they're already doing what people already like and then if you do that across a cast then uh, you know you, you you leave your strong characters alone, but then the whole cast becomes stronger and everything starts to come in line and balance. So like I've always been a principle of like don't take away stuff I like because it's because they're strong. Make everyone else stronger so that my stuff is not as I'm still having fun, but I'm not running away with games and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. I, I want to do more more stuff with like balancing and and um, you know just you know polishing a game and and stuff like that yeah like people's like the their philosophy in terms of balance and and where they're coming from at least from the developer side right Uh, because that can be really interesting i've always been on the side of give everyone broken shit broken shit in fighting games is what makes it good i'm a vampire (laughs) saber player man so like (laughs) everyone in that game is broken even like the worst character in that game has some bullshit thing they can do yeah that's what people love to do in fighting games is how much bullshit can you subject your opponent Mm -hmm. to and the less you can make them play, the more fun you're having. Obviously, right? If 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 you if you play fighting games and you say otherwise, you're lying. That's a lie. Right. That's a lie. <laughs> I want I want to see. I want to hit you with some shit that your eyes. I actually see your eyes spin back to the back of your head and then come back to the other side. And then I know I've I've got you. Like oh yeah, it's perfect. And you feel yeah. somebody like break next to you when you hit them with some weird thing and they just like deflate and you're like yeah, it's over, buddy. Like it's done. <laughs> Or like when the hand goes off the stick or like you just see them disengage entirely. You just go, yeah. yep, all right. Yeah, <laughs> yep. they're resigned to their fate. This is awesome. <laughs> but, yeah, but then there's like, I don't know, as someone who's been hit with shit like that, to me it's always like, all right, good shit. You got me. Yeah, that's part of the game. Like, you know, I, I can't tell you, like going back to Vampire Save, I can't be tell you that I've been in the corner and I see that damn fish bubble come out and I'm like, well, I'm fucked. Like, I need to come up with some or, or this round is just over. Like, it's just you have to accept it. And for the, and I think the pe- players that are really strong at the moment in, in the games they play are the people who have accepted. Like, yeah. you know, obviously a lot of people bitch on Twitter about buffs and nerfs and stuff like that. But oh like the, the people who don't and just like, all right, I'm just going to I'm going to just ride it and either, you know, play that character that's really strong or find ways to beat that character uh you know like i think back to like vanilla street fighter 4 where like sagat was rampant and oh. you know people were like well he's in the game we don't know if they're gonna like you know at that time people didn't even think like patching was possible so like we right. don't even know if they're gonna patch it out so fuck it like we're either gonna fight around him or we're gonna play him and that's that's what it was yeah because that game Hey kids, you might remember a time <laughs> where where games came out on the arcade cabinet first. Mm. What's <laughs> an arcade? Was, <laughs> that was a different time, and not the arcade cabinet coming out second, which is this this new strange world we live in. Oh man! Uh, but but no, that was trust me as a Zangief main. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I played Sagat. <laughs> that must have been bad for you. <laughs> I get it, but like that's that's one of those things where I've, I again, I've always been of this opinion where when you have when you run into a bad matchup, the stronger you can make that bad matchup, that that, that builds character. Which isn't to say that if I wanted to win, I should have switched characters. I know that in my head, mm-hmm. but am I a better overall fighting game player having gone through that and then? 
probably wouldn't be I probably wouldn't be as patient as I am today if if not for those times those dark yeah. times. You, you didn't have a choice, so it was either no. that or leave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but no. Uh, with that though, I mean, is there anything that you would want to point any particular uh, documentary that you've done that you would want to point people towards, or maybe uh, maybe hint at what might be coming further down the line? Oh, I can just tell you what's coming now. Like, okay. uh, <laughs> um, I have to. I'm actually in the middle of writing this huge patron post for for patrons, so they'll they'll see this with like pictures and stuff like that too. But uh, I've got a, a crazy backlog of stuff to get to. So I'm actually going to be doing. You just had him on a couple weeks ago, but I I went to when I was in Japan. I went to Fighting Tuesday. So I'm oh, going to be doing another episode of Locals focusing on Fighting Tuesday, and it's I interviewed uh, Majin Obama. So we're going to be talking about how that all came through and how you know a group of expats wound up you know putting together one of the biggest locals in the world yeah that's sick. uh so we got that um i'm doing a documentary on unist on the whole you know explosion of unist over the past year so i've been i've interviewed people like brett uh jushichi um uh, makoto fox and i've been talking to shinobi i'm actually going to climax of night next week uh and i'm going to be shooting there so that's going to be a good 45 30 to 45 minute video on uh unist uh after that, uh, we got some small surprises, so probably something cut out with Keats about netcode. I'm going to be talking to Emily from Equinox about what it's like to uh, put together and manage a team uh, oh, and what okay. goes into that. And then I think we're going to cap the year off with uh, what's looking to be an hour and a half to hour and a 35 minute documentary on Killer Instinct. <laughs> That is, that's an aggressive schedule. Everything yeah, you need, that's like a, that's a good line of documentaries that you have yeah. lined yeah. up. And, and maybe some surprises that. in between, but yeah, so my goal right now, my goal is to kind of finish up the year strong and see where things are at. Um, and then really start to push the channel pretty hard next year and see if I can either make that a full-time job or, you know, look at what kind of content it is, you know, patron wise and stuff like that. So mm. yeah, uh, like the channel has become a pretty big part of my life and I really want to like kind of, I want to push content to the next level because I really just am not happy with what's out there now. Right. Yeah. The, I think that what you have cut to get, which hmm, let me stop the tape right now and just say, <laughs> Hey folks, if you're listening to this and you haven't watched any of these documentaries, do so right now. Just go and like sniff out the quality because the quality is there. It's <laughs> pretty much any of any of the ones, any of the videos that you watch, or at least certainly the most recent one. It's like there's there's a caliber there that is beyond what we are used to in the community. From, I mean, even this podcast. This is a ramshackle ass podcast. <laughs> <laughs> talking to this dirty ass microphone, have, talking over the internet with the the quality that you get there. It's not. Uh, listen, folks. This is this is one. This is quick. These are quick hits of information. Go to these. Go to these documentaries, and then that's where you'll find all this good, 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 good nuggets of information. But anyway, aside from that, I'm done pitching. Uh, appreciate it. <laughs> uh, when you come back, folks, uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, is there any one of your older works that you would want to point? Is there anything that you're particularly proud of that you've done so far that you would want to point people to? Uh, I mean, I'm. I don't put anything out. I'm not happy with, but. Uh, I guess, you know, the, the tech documentary I did a year or two years ago with Bandai Namco that they, they graciously let me put on the channel because it was like an Amazon exclusive. You couldn't watch it un unless you had like Amazon Prime because it was like a tie-in deal with, with Tech and 7's release. Um, that deal expired and let me they just gave it to me like i, I gotta say like working bandai namco I, I shot a lot of their tech and i shot all the tech and documentaries for them in 2016 i work with them closely over the tech and world tour and stuff like that they're saints they just let me do whatever i want they just that's put sick. me to work and it's awesome uh, so they gave me that so it's a uh, the road to king of iron fist that's a really good one we put that up maybe two months ago um like right around the time that the numbers for TechNet evo came out so it was a good way to be like Oh yeah, this all these people are playing Tekken. How do we get here? And so to hear people like Rixta and MYK and stuff like that talk about, well, I really hope Tekken, you know, could be a little bit bigger this time, and you know, people can play like for for years on end, and then to have like the biggest Tekken tournament ever happen at Evo um, was a really cool cool moment. Um, but then there's other stuff like obviously the channel has been around for like five or so, probably seven of the years at this point now. Um, so there are things like um, uh, like the Galileo comeback at Blaze Blue in 2014, 
uh, with him screaming when he's playing Dogra, when he's making that comeback. That's like mm -hmm. the clip. That's like the clip I'm still hear people talk to me about. Yeah, um, people meant when it, when people talk about all time favorite matches, that's one that comes up. Yeah, uh, and and it's interesting because it's like uh, it's about being in the right place in the right time, like just for the shot. But also, I'm very partial to anime. Uh, like the anime scene because i've been playing that's where i kind of like grew up in like i played guilty gear with people like stick bug and stuff like that in college like i would mm -hmm. drive to Rutgers, and and not even knowing who like these people were like not even knowing that they ran like locals and stuff like that i would just play with them because i i like to play with them and that's how i started to get into the scene um so like it was always disheartening to me to be like everyone was focusing on street fighter or all this kind of stuff and like i'm watching like the greatest stories ever happen in like these pools or on this main stage where anime games stuff like that so like i wanted to shine a spotlight and i think that clip went a long way to be like oh like this is like a crazy moment that's happening and it's not a street fighter title or it's not a capcom title right maybe we should be paying attention to, to this stuff over here so I, I'm really proud of that one, and and yeah, I, I always go back to that one every now and then. Like this is this is dope. I would cut a little differently now, and like it'd be a little bit shorter, but I like that. Plus, there's also the one of Hungry Box punching the TV that makes me laugh all the time. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm familiar with that. I, I don't think I know the lore on. He that. was playing. It was it was also 2000. No, it was it was. It was 2015, I think we were back at the Paris. So like it was like May. It was like that was a year that uh, it was like. It definitely outgrew the venue it was in, so there was like bodies everywhere, uh, and like the melee section was like, it was like also next to the Guilty Gear pools, but they like swallowed up the Guilty Gear pools at one point. So like there was just a sea of people for melee, and I believe it's Hungry Box versus Leffen to get into top eight or at least further in the tournament, and Hungry Box beats Leffen and like doesn't know how to react. And he just gets up and he slaps the TV as hard as he can, like at the top of it. And like Blur, who used to work at Twitch, that's his TV. You see him in the back. And as as the TV gets hit, he just puts his hands like, what? Come on, man. That's my TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a really good moment because like you tell how, how happy a hungry box is and also how pissed Leffen is and how upset Blur is for the TV's getting hit. Like it's just an, it's just a crazy like moment. And I just happen to be there just recording for the hell of it. And it just made me laugh. So that that's a good one to go back to. Come on, man. There's only so many CRTs in existence, Yeah, like, man. that's a rarity, dude. <laughs> like, we don't have many of those yet left. Like, come on, dude. No, I, I love that picture that it paints of the, the many emotions in one shot. Yeah. Uh, no, that's cool. Uh, so anyway, folks, go watch those. That's good stuff. Uh, anything else that you want to pitch before we kind of move on to next topics? Uh, yeah, you, you know, We've been talking about content for for a couple minutes here now, but uh, this shit isn't free. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm not saying like give me money, but fucking give me money. No, uh, uh, you need to support your content creators. Like, whether yeah. it is with things like you know Patreon. Like we've you know we got a couple of those. Like things like Core Gaming have a Patreon. Pat the Flip has a Patreon. I have a Patreon. Um, or Hi -Fi has a Patreon. Hi Fi has a Patreon. Or like even like nice comments. Like, hey, I love your work. Please keep doing what you're doing um, or sharing the stuff that we do around. It, it matters. Like, it matters a lot. Like, a lot of people don't understand this. I was actually just hanging out with Gerald, um, Corey Gaming, for those who don't know him, uh, in, in Korea, and we were talking about it. Like, this is a grind. Um, all this good stuff I've been talking about making means that I'm sitting at the desk, desk that I'm sitting at right now um, for the next, you know, 300, 400 hours cutting this stuff together, putting it together. Right. I don't get to go out. I don't get to see friends. I don't get to, I hardly get to see family and stuff like that. Or I'm traveling around to go record this stuff and then I'm going back and I'm editing. Same thing with the, the content creators you love. Gerald is literally isolated and like trying to make the best analytical video he can make um, while also not taking too long with it and, and trying not to go crazy. Like we work long hours, we work hard and it's very, it's like we work in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, it's fun for us at the end of the day. Like, obviously, we do this stuff because we love it, because there's a, there's a self-satisfying uh, reaction we get when we do it. But we want to know that the, we're not just speaking to nobody. So whether right. that is with with your money, which we are very grateful for, and, and you know that's you know that goes a long way to helping us keep doing this, or with your words, or you know by sharing the videos, it goes a long way to to keep us going because this is a tough job. And it may look like it's very easy. We you know, you know how hard is it to cut in Premiere? It's very fucking hard uh, when you've been doing it for for like 
days on end and you've been sacrificing sleep so that we can get this stuff out for you guys and you um, have hours I, of of material to cut through yeah. and cut yeah. together and and we're just correctly. people right like we're not yeah. you know you look at uh like 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 an outlook like the score like they make they make good stuff but they also have teams of people like they have multiple editors they have producers and all this kind of stuff so they can kind of distribute the load a little bit mm -hmm. easier there's when also you're just outside money funding it as well yeah so yeah that's right yeah like they get paychecks and maybe healthcare if you're lucky <laughs> uh yeah. i pay for healthcare so like thank you to my adoring patrons for paying for my healthcare uh but it's it's uh it's it's a grind and we love it but we want to make sure that you guys love it too and and um you know just like i said even if you can't support us with money because that's harder to to come around these days like just telling us that you like it just sharing the work that goes a long way yeah i think that it's important to point out here too is that you i feel like asking people to share it is super important because the fgc doesn't work in ways that please the algorithms. Nope. Uh, if you look at what con what types of content does well on, well, specifically YouTube, it's like 10 minute videos that are cut in a specific way that have mm. these specific things about them. And those are the things that are getting promoted uh, that come out like that you literally have to make a video every day to, yeah. <laughs> to keep on track and stay in the algorithm to get mass views. However, ways that we can combat that is to work within the network that we've built as a community of people to say subscribe to the channel mm -hmm. ring the bell uh like the videos watch it all the way have ad block off all of these things like adds up to something that is more substantial than just hoping that a good piece of content works within the algorithm because there's ton there's there is tons of good content out there there's tons right. of people creating good stuff I, you're one of the people you've named a bunch of them already mm. uh i would like throw born free into that as well yes. and among many other creators who as of right now the only way that it makes financial sense for them to continue doing work is through patreon because these solo projects don't get they don't pull in numbers like yeah and that was that was like another on. reason why why i went to, to patreon is, is partly because of no clip because no clip was like an ad free uh yeah. platform that that you know obviously danny has a much larger following than i have so like he you know they're, they're doing really well um and i knew i was going to be uh i was not going to have i was going to have like a small fraction of that success but it's because, as you said, like this system is not built for us. So why care about it? Like I'm going to, I don't care if a video I put out gets 10 views or 10,000 views. I shouldn't care. I should care that the 40 to 50 people that I have as patrons are happy. If they're happy, that's all that matters to me. So if a video gets 50 like views and all those 50 people are patrons of mine and they enjoy it, dope. That's the only way you're going to be sustainable. If you're chasing like million dollar, a uh, million view, like videos, stuff like that, then you're going to burn yourself out, especially if you're a one man team. Like you can't like core gaming can't put out of what they do no. every, not every week, let alone every day. It just, it's just not possible. So if this algorithm is not working for us, we have to find out other ways to make it work for us so we can keep the quality consistent and still love what we do. Because I'll tell you this, if I was making a documentary every day, I would go fucking crazy and I would not be enjoying what I do. So that was like another big part of like, you know, fuck the algorithm, fuck the views, fuck the ads. Like I'm just going to make what I want to make and the people that want to support me are going to support me and that's what I got to live with and that's what I'm going to do. Um, and then, you know, just not get caught up in the machine because at one point I was and it was awful. I was trying to mm. interview as many people as possible to put out a video every day and I was just running myself ragged and it was like, I can't do this anymore and that's why I left to do client stuff because it's like, this is this is killing me. Right. And then the client work is actually like steady, stable work, but maybe yeah. not pushing you uh, creatively, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. No. And outside of the like, you know, I, I don't want to like pinpoint people and stuff like that. But like, you know, out, I'm, it's very lucky to I'm very lucky to have somebody like Bandai Namco who was like, hey, go like go go do what you're going to do. And, you know, you know, we'll just make sure there's nothing weird on in there, like on a corporate level. And then, you know. You know, go talk to people, go make the stories. Like I did a Soul Calibur thing for them on Soul Calibur's release, which is like a doc called uh, Souls and Swords. And we 
put that out on the release of Soul Calibur, and it just talks about like uh, a, it's like the the crux of the story is like the revival of Soul Calibur, but also like a tournament that happened in France in like 2002 that Aris played at. Like, what company <laughs> lets you do that? And they were like, cool, this is awesome, and they put it up, and it, it did well, and people really liked it. So like. It's very. I'm very lucky to have certain clients that just let me, that trust me to do what I do. Same thing with like, even outside of finding games like Games Done Quick, like Sumi hired me for that, and they just let me do what I do. So, um, you're not always lucky to have clients like that. And usually, it's a little more regiment. Like we need this, we need that, we need that. But you really appreciate the guys that that let you kind of take the ball and run with it. That's cool. I, I actually, it's something that you mentioned earlier. I just want to maybe put another. Like congratulations to Bandai Namco for letting you have that video because I feel like a lot of the times people are like, man, Bandai Namco, they're shutting down tournaments. They're <laughs> of like shit that they heard from someone else that is like not actually fully in, like information, like not the correct shit. But like, no, they they obviously give a fuck about the community. They wouldn't have done something like that to uh <laughs> to give you the video at, at yeah, the end. Yeah, that of whole it. team is is like. Uh, like I just love working with this team. Anytime I get a chance to do it, anytime I get a chance to see them and and just talk, or even just to hang out and stuff like that. Like I, it is because of Bandai Namco and that team, like Mark R and Jason, and and I don't want to name too many names. I'm definitely gonna leave somebody out, and like right. Mark Man and stuff like that. But like, it is because of that team. Is because of that 2016 Tekken project that I'm even able to do what I do for a living, like video stuff. Like without them, I don't get to where i am now so i am very indebted to, to folks like them and and people like like you know, gutex gave me a start early on when i was doing video stuff and, and biggie and stuff like that so like i'm very loyal to those people that have helped me get to where i am now and they're definitely a big part of that yeah they they put a little bit of faith in you and then trusted you to do the good work you do the good work and well they believe Here in I the am. community yeah exactly <laughs> It's, you know, people giving big companies like that, giving chances to people within the community is, I don't know. You like to see that shit. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is kind of an aside. We're going to take a sidestep for just All a right. moment. I play question... Tekken, so I love sidestep. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, no, no backs way. Uh, no backs ways. <laughs> uh, but uh, I did want to ask, I, it was something that I thought of, like, as I started this interview, I was like, man, I should, like, ask him. A, a documentarian question. Sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to dig deep now. Well, not maybe okay. not. Uh, but as a documentarian, do you have any like documentaries, even outside of the FGC, something that like piques your interest? A particular documentary that you're like, that is, that's a good bit of work. That is something that is inspirational. Oh man, I actually, it's surprisingly enough, I actually don't watch too many documentaries. <laughs> okay. I don't. Um, I, like I'm very I'm very big on not poisoning the well in terms of like my influences and my style and stuff like that like i have my style and i watch a lot of other things outside of documentaries to kind of kind of incorporate that stuff into documentaries like i think that's smart um i did watch one called bones brigade i think that's what it's called yeah it was like uh it's a documentary on like tony hawk and that whole kind of like group of skaters that grew like tony hawk rodney mullen like bob burnquist stuff like that that, that grew up in that whole sort of like forming like basically forming what skateboarding is today right. um and that was pretty cool that was a good one. i watched that a couple of years ago and i really liked that um but yeah i don't watch too many documentaries because uh, i just i just don't like i just don't i don't find it's like weird to say don't find the medium interesting outside of what i do <laughs> which is like very fucking pompous uh but i just don't like i don't want to sit down and watch a ken burns documentary about you know the war of 1812 or whatever the fuck he's working on uh <laughs> <laughs> I want I'm more interested in watching like those master class things like I haven't bought one yet but like I'll watch a Ken Burns master class on him making documentaries because I'm more interested in the process and the decisions they make when making the content like I'm I'm more interested in that than some of the actual videos themselves That's so that interests me more than than actual product is like really weird to say i'm just a pompous asshole no i, I don't i don't <laughs> think that that's a that's a weird thing to say because I, I like personally i as someone who commentates matches i don't like to listen to other commentary because right. i don't want anyone else's affectations to rub off on what i might later say because right. then it's just iterative and why would i want to do that i i would much rather go my own way and have other outside influences like i like I would have rather listened to other sports 
like radio cat broadcasts uh, to get some other influences on how I might call a match or some exciting things I might want to say or you mm. know, just shit like that. So I, I can understand that point of view or that perspective at least. Yeah, like I just rewatched. Um, it's like it's a great movie. I just rewatched the Mor- the Martian on the flight like recently, mm. and like that like. Like there are things I took from there, like how to use effective voiceover to tell a story and how to how to frame a shot. And especially because like that movie is basically if you haven't seen it, it's about uh, Matt Damon being stranded on Mars. It, it's mm-hmm. a lot bigger than that. But it, it's it's like, you know, it's about conflict resolution and how you illustrate that in a, in a movie. Um, and a lot of fighting game stuff is conflict resolution. Like, you know, you have one player against another player. How do they how did, who won and why like what are the what are the series of steps they had to go through um to beat another player so, and how they illustrate that in the movie is is wonderful and perfect yeah. and so like i'll take lessons from that and that'll go into like something i do in the future yeah it's funny you just said that the movie is like very documentary like because it, yes. it is very step by step okay i have to do this if i want if I want water, I need to do this if i want to have if I have yes. to grow plants, I have to do this <laughs> it is the simplest movie. <laughs> Ever. Outside the fact that they had to make, like, you believe he was on Mars. Like, that's crazy right. in itself. But, like, outside of that, it's literally, like, I need to eat. I need to drink. I have 30 days of supplies that have to last me four years. How do I do it? And you either do it or you die. Like, it's it's simple. It's just a simple movie. And they throw little things on top of it to kind of spice it up a little bit. But that's all it is. It's just conflict resolution and, you know, kind of keeping your wits about you. And how you turn that you know, which was originally a story, like how do you turn that book into a, a you know, a million dollar earning movie and something, a multi-million dollar earning movie is is pretty crazy how they did it. So like, I'm more interested, I'm more interested to answer your question the long way around. I'm more interested in <laughs> the how and why instead of the actual like finished product. All right. The workman's answer. I, I appreciate yes. that. All right. So after that sidestep about talking about documentaries, let's slip into an, a more FGC related stuff. Sure. Uh, because we actually have a question uh, from people who wrote in, which, by the way, folks, if you have any questions, uh, please write in at RSF radio questions at gmail dot com. Uh, this one comes in from Body Novel, actually, uh, who we spoke about on last week's show, who does great work, by the way. He's a fantastic writer. Uh, but he wrote in and asked kind of a simple question, but it, this one at least got me thinking, and I think that you might have some answers, some fun answers to this as well. Mm. Uh, but what is your favorite crazy, like, how things used to work story? Is there any kind of things, <sighs> how things worked in the past that you are surprised that things might have worked out that way or why, like, dis- why decisions were made uh, th- things or how things used to be versus how they are now what's like your old man story I think the craziest thing and it's something nobody ever really talks about and uh, all right there is this thing called arcades that people used to go to and, <laughs> and play at in America I'm like I'm 31 I'm not too old but I'm old enough to, to you know remember an arcade um and there used to be a thing where like well you know people would play on the arcades but obviously you have to take turns right like like how do you take turns uh and people used to put quarters on top of the cabinet and you know you keep track of where your quarter is like you know first person first quarter in line is the next person after the game was they pick the quarter up they put it in after next person quarter comes out until your turn came up and then you play um I don't know how that started and how like nobody just went up there and stole all the quarters from the arcade cabinets or whatnot. Um, but I've always been curious about like how that happened and how that like system like maintained itself. It was like an unspoken law yeah. of like, hey, you need to wait until your turn and your turn is dig- dignified by this quarter. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that would even fly nowadays because I go to. I go to a lot of tournaments and stuff like that, and people are just like, oh, one more, one more, and then one more. Like, that shit did not happen when you had money, like, when you're putting money into the machines. Like, nah, bro, it's my turn, uh, because that's my quarter right there, and I'm going up. Or that's my, like, people got smart. Like, I used to do things like put a penny up there, but, like, that's definitely me. Like, you can't even lie and say that's you, because right. you're not the penny. I'm the penny. Uh, <laughs> I got the quarter right here, but that penny is my hole. Yeah, that's my that's place my, marker. Like, that's my novel right there. I'm the penny. The Esteban Martinez story. Uh, 
Okay. But, uh, <laughs> I like how you you said that very quickly as to be like, you know, this is this is like like things move fast up here, dude. Like you either gotta get catch up or get run the fuck over. Like that's how it is. Um, but yeah, like like the quarter line has always been like a cool like even our kids themselves like are cool like this is how this used to happen. And and obviously in some countries they still have them. Like Japan is happening still with arcades, so that's sadly changing. Like they just put out the news that a nuts in a warehouse is closing um mm-hmm. this month which is like if you if you're in japan before you know november 17th like go out to kawasaki it's like an hour outside of tokyo and go to this arcade it's an entire arcade designed after the kowloon world's walled city in china it's fucking crazy just go like just go if you're going before it closes on november 17th just go you're not going to regret it um but yeah like you know arcades quarter lines that's kind of it's kind of an archaic way of thinking nowadays because we don't have it but i've always wondered about that and how that came to be well i mean it also like changed the way that people played like it was mm-hmm. it wasn't like it's that whole thing of like when you see someone wildly dp it's like in in the u.s when 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 some like quote unquote random player does a random DP, you can look at him and go, he's playing like he's got nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. Whereas you might come from an era where it's like, I have a quarter to lose. So yeah. why would I do the dangerous thing? Well, it's instead? not even that. It's like, I would do the dangerous thing if, you know, I do have a quarter to lose and I know they're not going to expect this random DP. And if I hit him with this, I get to stay on the machine while this dude's got to walk to the change machine. Like mm. that's, that's the other, like people like the frame, like, oh, it's wild. It's like, no, nah, it's, it's, it's what I got to do to stay on this machine uh and there's like a little bit of desperation in there because you are playing for money like that's why i like playing in japan so much uh because it's like if i don't win this match i'm losing actual money right uh so i'm going to play very different like every match is a money match so i'm going to be playing at very differently and maybe more aggressive or maybe smarter um, than i would if we were just playing like casuals like you know first to 50 i got 50 games to play with everything's a first to one over there I got one game to play with, and if I don't play right, it's over. Uh, yeah, stakes I, stakes are not actually high, but stakes are high. <laughs> yeah, like stakes are <laughs> relatively high, right? Uh, and I miss I miss that environment because it did make like if you look at before, you know, especially like Street Fighter Four time. Like if you look at like the stronger regions, there were the regions that had arcades or like uh, arcade like environments, like New York, Austin, or you know, like SoCal, NorCal. Like they had those places where like the best players were playing and they were playing at the highest, relatively highest stakes. Like, you know, especially mm-hmm. Street Fighter 4 where you know, those machines came out, like Chinatown Fair had one, like I think Arcade Infinity and like um, Keystone had one. And like those places, like, and you were limited. Like you either got to like five game, five wins and you're off, or if you lost a game, you're out and they were like a dollar a game. So like all those players got really strong because they're trying to maximize their playtime on these limited setups because this is the only like it wasn't out on consoles or anything like that so this is the only chance mm-hmm. to play and i think that breeds a different kind of player now we have online and online breeds a different kind of player because uh you know network conditions like as we talked about might not be the yeah. best so <laughs> you get it like this grimy the... stuff and stuff like that which is awesome like i like that and some of the best players come from there like you know punk like obviously i live in philly so like we have punk who's mm-hmm. arguably the best street fighter 5 player in the world right now punk um, smug smug all those players yeah yeah, that's right. Smug is there. also, you know, you know, online play and stuff like that. So I used to remember it, on the XBL, it's Smug, Smugglesworth, Mister. He had like ninety <laughs> of them. Like, Grandma Smug. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, it, that environment has moved to online and stuff like that. So it's just, yeah. yeah, pretty cool. I know I ramble a lot of it. I know this was like about old man ways, but like we went to a other direction. That's no, me. That's no, how my that's, brain works. That would be interesting to to hear from like how did things even start that way? Um, yeah. I know that this question when I thought of it, I thought of how the online tournament cuz run the online tournament every week and just thinking mm-hmm. about how they used to run and really this made me think about like how I feel like like I must have had so much life in me when I would <laughs> run the East Coast online tournament on uh we would we used to run them on Thursday nights. And the, no, no, no. It was, it was like Tuesday for a while, and then it was Wednesday. 
it has changed around. But anyway, when we first started running them, I ran the East Coast tournament, and then immediately following the East Coast tournament, starting at 11 p.m. Oh, no. East Coast time, I would begin the West Coast tournament. Like I would go back to back online tournament. You should and this live is, in reckless <laughs> abandon, huh? It was it. Like thinking back to that time, I'm like, how did my body survive that? Like, what was I thinking? Like, oh, trust me, I understand that feeling all too well. It was a di- like, I, because I, I, I think of the physical toll it would take for someone to like for my human body to do that. Now I'm like, fuck no, that's a terrible idea. And this was in the SF4 days when it was like to have two commentators because you couldn't set the rounds to, to like two. They you'd have to go to to the back of the line and they would have to ready up and go to the back of the line yep. every time. Yep. Oh man, those were. More Those were the days. days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> online Street Fighter Four was a lot more fucked up than people like to think back oh, <laughs> than, man. than it was. Uh, but that's uh, just another one of those little things. Uh, all right, uh, so we're kind of running up against the wall here on time. So I want to ask you the question that I ask everyone before before I let you go, uh, before we uh, close the lights on this episode. I have to ask you a line of question that comes in two parts. And I think that the way that you answer this question can tell a lot about your character and who you are as a person. Uh, The first part of the question is, what is your favorite normal attack in any fighting game? Uh, My favorite normal attack? I think, yeah, my favorite normal attack is uh, Tal Bane's Crouching Medium Punch. Because it's bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) It is is literally, it's, it's... Chun Li's standing heavy punch from Third Strike, but better and faster. <laughs> oh, okay. That gives uh, me so, a very good idea. Of, yeah, of, so I'm I'm a zoning player, be. so like I like to zone with like footsie and stuff like that. And Tal Bane is like my favorite character outside of like Slayer and Guilty Gear, like as my favorite fighting game character. Right. So like the ability to like, oh, I'm gonna zone you with just this one button, and then when you get frustrated, I'm gonna hit you with eighty percent with my beast cannon. Like that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, man. That is I like that. I like that answer. Also, Slayer. Let me ask you this because I feel like which normal att- uh, which Slayer normal tells you a lot about how you play as that character. Uh, for people, uh, <laughs> Slayer's normals are uh, fucking gorgeous. I so I don't I don't have too much experience with Exer. Like I played it here and there, but Slayer wasn't Slayer and Exer. Like my Slayer is Accent Core Slayer. That's the game. Like, Absolutely, I hell played, yeah. Like like a madman, um, and I like Standing Heavy Slash because it's a another bullshit button that hits way too far than, than it should and if it hits you it staggers you like and if it hits you in the air it ground bounces you uh or in plus r like causes a slide from for more like to the corner and stuff like that that's that's a great that's a great button i just like i just like to hit a person so hard that they just <laughs> stagger backwards <laughs> yeah it's be and like when you see that little like the joystick pop it's like oh that's good <laughs> yeah that's my turn now <laughs> Oh uh, man, yeah. Oh, good answer. I love I love someone who loves some bullshit buttons. Uh, part two of the question though is kind of an extension of that. But what is your favorite combo in any fighting game? Oh man, combo! <sighs> it doesn't have to be one. You can have multiple. I have let people answer with multiple combos or. You know, so I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back to Slayer. Like, really? okay. Yeah, Slayer. Like I, I, it's like not a predetermined combo, but it, it uses an Axicore. He has his uh, his two, his jumping to K, like his kick, his jumping down kick. It's mm-hmm. like this weird like backflip he does. He kind of has it in excerpt but it's not the same uh and it just opened up so many like weird combo routes you can do so like you could get like 20 to 30 hits or like you know 15 anywhere between the range of, like 15 and 30 hits because all his buttons just work so well where like you can do that right before you hit the ground which would make you land before your opponent and then do like standing heavy slash to re like relaunch them off the ground so like mm-hmm. anything like any aerial combo and in, in with slayer and accent core it's just fun to hit in current modern games, like I play a lot of Kazumi and uh, Tekken, and just her basic, her like basic B and B combo, uh, which like ends with the tiger launching you into the wall, is fun to hit because it's kind of difficult. It's like not too difficult, but like f- for me, who's like just starting to learn Tekken, like you have to hit like at one point you have to micro dash forward, then hit back forward two one, um, 
And you can easily mess that up and get her power crush, and that'll like push to the wall, or but you won't. It won't be as satisfying. But when you hit it and like you hit the whole thing, you take somebody to the wall, and now you have like now your gameplay is in place. That's really satisfying. So any kind of I guess any kind of combo that lets you one express a little creativity or two uh, start your game plan is a combo I really like. And those are like two examples. Yeah, those are like your your can openers of you're gonna eat whatever I'm gonna throw at you, or you're gonna eat this mix up on the back right. end. There's one more, but it's not a combo. It's just anytime I can finish all hits of Beast Cannon with Talbain. <laughs> okay. It's not really a combo. It's one move, but like it's just fun to hit people with, and people are like, how the hell did you finish that? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Well, that's a good answer. I, I like, again, I like someone who's willing to throw as much bullshit uh, at their oh, opponent. Oh, I'm cheap, dude. I come from the East Coast, and I play in arcades. I can't, I'm not fair. Like, if I'm, I'm, I'm No. Absolutely. Uh, well, with that, uh, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, pleasure talking about the old, re- remembering how times used to be, and looking times forward old. to <laughs> looking forward to seeing how uh, some of, like the recording of that history, because it seems like that's something that you are on a mission to do. And I hope that you, the listener, have heard what Esteban has to say and feel like that is something worth financially supporting. Uh, I think it's worthwhile, and I think that you should too. Uh, but before we go. One last time, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can watch all my work at youtube.com slash holdbacktoblock. If you like what you see there, you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash holdbacktoblock. We got a bunch of goodies for you guys there. Uh, and if you aren't tired about me or, you know, think I'm, you know, not too old after this conversation, you can follow me at twitter.com slash the best of bond. <laughs> All right, folks, you can find me at Super Joe Monday on Twitter.com or at Reddit SF. Or, of course, just hop on our Street Fighter at any time and you know, post your shit there. Like, that's, that's a good way to promote stuff. I always say, like, again, another way to support content is to upvote the stuff that you like, downvote the stuff that you don't like. Uh, that, that is an easy way to elevate good material. Uh, other than that, look out for the tournaments on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, and as always, shout outs to Piano Densetsu for the opening track. Uh, it's dope as fuck. And also write in if like, if you want me to post that, just that song by itself, I'll do it. I just haven't had the time to, but if enough people speak up, I'll just post it and it'll be good. Uh, cause it's a cool track. At least I think it's very good. Uh, go follow that guy. He is dope as fuck and a very good, like musician just in general. Uh, other than that, that's show folks until next Thursday. Take care.